Hello, everyone, and welcome to Cybersecurity in ISO 27001, Implementing a Secure Information Security Management System, presented by the DeSera Group. My name is Karen Rawson. I'm the Vice President of the DeSera Group. And uh, what, what we do is we help companies implement management systems of all kinds. We've got uh, expertise in telecommunications and management system standards such as ISO 9001 and TL 9000 and others in addition to ISO 27001. And we're a small consulting company where we only employ consultants who have uh, senior level experience, director level experience. This is not a company with uh, that sends out you know, junior right out of MBA school um, uh, consultants. One of the things that we do besides helping companies implement the management system is we do all kinds of audits, such as internal audits and supplier audits and gap assessments, or going in and doing an investigation when something has actually gone wrong to say what failed in the process. We, we have our certificate, how did we have this mistake? We accomplish that through doing on-site and virtual instructor-led courses as well as delivering these free webinars so that you can learn more about who DeSera is and what we do, and maybe we can come in and help you at some point. You'll be getting notifications of our upcoming um, classes and so forth, but uh, we love to do the on-site classes where we get an implementation team together and really take them through, guide them through implementing a management system. For our webinar today, We'll talk about some basic information about, about risks and approaches to cybersecurity and information security, but the bulk of the presentation is on what is required to implement ISO 27001, including the controls in Annex A. And I'll explain what the difference in the clauses and the controls are as we go forward, and then we'll talk about um, going through the process of implementing the model inside your company. What does it take to work towards certification, get certified, and how do you get started? Before we go any further, I want to uh, call your attention to the workbook. And the, uh, we, the first question we usually get in this presentation is on, online on the panel, on your GoToWebinar control panel. Realize you can ask questions through that panel, and uh, I'll be alerted to those, and I'll be sure to answer any at the end of the call. Write down what slide number your questions are on, but also on that panel where you can ask questions, you'll see that there's a handouts panel. We've got a workbook that you can either download and print or um, type right in, in the Word version of it, and also a PDF of the presentation. You'll also have access to the recording of this tomorrow. We'll send that out tomorrow, and we'll ask for your feedback on a survey about information security, and really appreciate it if you can fill that out. So go ahead and download the handouts if you haven't already. They'll be up throughout the webinar, but the workbook will help you refer back to this when you talk to people in the next, um, next time you talk to people about information security management systems. I'm very curious about why you've joined the webinar today. And if you could chat that into me right now, uh, let me know, are you, uh, you know, what's going on with your company? Are you implementing? Have you already implemented? or are you just gathering more information about what might come? I, uh, I love to glance at the slides and see answers to questions like, who do I have on the call? Because there's simply not enough time to get around to everyone so that I can see your perspective. But I hope we have all kinds of different people on the call today. You're in the right place if you're a senior manager who understands that uh, you've got risks in the company from all fronts, but information security is one of them that you need to understand because you'll be seeing it in contracts and you know you need to protect your business. IT people are already very well aware of risks to information, to the security, the integrity, the availability, the confidentiality of information, but they realize they can't do it alone. IT professionals, particularly the leadership, know that they can't just plug the leaks in their end of the, bo of the boat they need to be sure the whole boat is secure, and it takes a full organization at all levels to make information security successful. Members of the technical staff may be turning the wrenches, so to speak, with the bits and bytes, but you need to see the big picture, how the entire company is involved and what's involved in certification. You may hear, oh, we're having an audit, and you don't know the difference between a customer audit, an inspection of an installation, for example, or an actual certification audit. So this will help you understand what's involved in certification. I'll bet we have a lot of quality professionals on the line today 
because that's often how our, our list skews. You've already got experience with management systems such as ISO 9001, I'll bet. You'll find that a lot of things we talk about today, you already understand because you've studied ISO 9001. Your skills will be very helpful in guiding your company to develop an information security management system. Oops, I think I went backward on that one, sorry. Finally, if you're a sales professional, sales professionals are seeing requirements for information security different regulations, different standards within contracts. And before you say, sure we can, you want to understand what's required in those, in those um, standards that you're signing up for and what it's going to take for your company to implement. Can't tell you how many times somebody gets a contract and says, yes, we'll, we'll, take, we'll take your money. And then they start saying, hey, to Sarah, can you come in and uh, help us get this? We told them we already do it. I mean, maybe not quite that bad, but that idea, they know they're bidding on contracts that are going to require it. The thing is, you don't know whether your competitors are already well on their way to getting their certification. If you're a sales professional, um, you may think you can negotiate it away, and maybe this year you can, but one of these years is going to come by where it's just table stakes, kind of like ISO 9001 has become. When you think about why companies pursue information security management systems, the big thing that everybody comes to at first is confidentiality. We've got confidential business information, our sales records, our legal records, our uh, employee information, um, information about our designs and our products that we don't want to get out of the four walls of our business. So we want to assure confidentiality. But it's not just about confidentiality. You have to figure that if your data is wrong or um, uh, it's, it's been lost, if you ever failed to save your most recent version of something and you just want to tear your hair out, well, imagine if that happens on a large scale of a business, losing a whole year's worth of data because some system went down and wasn't properly backed up. I mean, I've got my Carbonite and my, and my online uh, uh, storage of all my information on my computer, but that's on the small scale. Well, what do you have on the large scale for a business? The integrity of the data, to be sure that you have access to all the data you need is important. And then what if there's a physical disaster, some reason that you... Um, maybe something has happened to the servers on which your data is stored or a fire burns up your, your paper documents or you simply can't get into the building to work. It's just as good as not having the information at all. You have to ensure that the availability of your information. How frustrating is it? I saw the other day that um, Microsoft Office, uh, Office 365 was down and it was affecting all kinds of major companies. I mean, the entire West Coast PG&E and, and uh, uh, Edison Power, Edison Power and Light, I guess it is in Southern California, were without their Microsoft Office 365. They couldn't, well, it was SharePoint. They couldn't get into SharePoint for a couple of hours there. And we're on that as well at Desera. So we were just as handcuffed as some of the big companies. Availability of information, whether it's due to natural causes or um, some sort of problem with the equipment itself can affect availability. I think we all think of information security in terms of the bad guy, the malicious hackers that get in to get information out of our systems or actually get into our products. So we really want to protect from the bad guys on all three fronts, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, because bad guys can affect all three of those things. So we want a system that keeps people out. Well, then I would ask you, how has your company considered the risks to your information and the systems that process it? Chances are you're already doing a lot of things. You may wear a badge. There may be locked rooms that only IT can get into. You may have requirements for encrypting documents when you send them outside the company, for example, or encrypting your laptops. So you're probably already doing a number of things, even unbeknownst to you, but companies with an information security management system, particularly one based on ISO 27001, face risks by doing several important things. First of all, it starts at the top. Management has planning and oversight over a management system, over the way things work to make sure we're getting confidentiality, integrity, and availability as we intend to. So they would have goals and measurements associated with those, the, with those three uh, factors. A company that has an ISMS 
has to have a systematic method of analyzing the risks to their information and how are they going to mitigate those risks. That's the kind of thing that auditors come in and pour over, spend a lot of time looking at, did you effectively define what your risks are, how high those risks are, and do something about the worst ones, the ones that cause you the most nightmares. Now, things are going to go wrong, even when you set up the best the best system you can afford to set up for the information that you're that you're protecting. But a company with an ISMS is required to have a systematic method for investigating and correcting security incidents. So for example, if, um, if you've uh, had an outage, how do we investigate that loss of availability of information so it doesn't happen again? Another thing that companies have um, companies with a management system have is change management. That is, when you change something in the system, you expose it to risk. You know, maybe information won't be available or maybe you've injected a, uh, a, um, a hole through which hackers can get. So you want to make sure that change management is done in a way that won't, uh, won't uh, put, your, put your information at risk. The leadership of an organization with an ISMS has to have methods of evaluating whether they're being effective with this system. You can't just stand it up and say, there you go. You're doing all these things. You have to watch and see, are we actually doing them? Because as everyone knows, people perform what the boss inspects rather than just what the boss expects. So you've got to go back and be sure these things are working if you've got a management system. And finally, it's a company-wide approach if you have an ISMS rather than just IT doing things to protect information. These are what an organization pursuing ISO 27001 will have. If you want to take notes on this or take a screenshot, this is a good Cliff's Notes page, or what do they call it now, Sparks Notes page, of what do you have to put in place to get certified to ISO 27001. And you can take notes on that at the top of, um, at the top of page two of your workbook. Let's go ahead and grab a screenshot if you're going to do that. And moving on. You see the title of the presentation was Cybersecurity, uh, Implementing an Information Security Management System. Well, there is in some organizations, uh, the words are used interchangeably, and in others, they're consciously used separately. So I just want to point out the difference and tell you that today, we're using them synonymously and don't get hung up on the terms or the perceived differences what ISO 27001 requires is information security, meaning all information, whether it's stored in cyberspace or whether it's stored in a file cabinet in your back room or in the heads of your employees. Um, depending on the point of view, you can say that, oh, everything is stored in the cloud or on, online somehow, uh, standalone, whatever. And other people will say, oh, no, there's a lot more information than just out there. So we'll use cybersecurity and information security interchangeably, the standard 27001 refers to information security and uh, other standards refer to cybersecurity. Why companies get involved in ISO 27001, spend the money to implement it and to have it audited every year? The main reason is risk. The fact that you don't want to be the company like Target that has their name up in lights because of a, of a breach. Marriott had a big one where our account numbers and phone numbers and maybe even passport numbers were stolen. Huge loss of reputation. And people are going to turn away. They're not going to stay there if there's a problem. It's like finding bed bugs in your hotel. You're not going to go back there if somebody, if somebody messed you up once. But the business itself has a lot to clean up the mess. And then the customers do. Customers may not get their orders filled. There may be downstream impact. Their information may be exposed and they've got to pay money to clean up the mess. So it's not just a risk to your business, but to your customers and even to the public. Do the dom domino effect where problems can be propagated and everyone loses trust in information security. And you know what happens if people lose trust in information security? Regulations. And a lot of us really don't like to have the government breathing down our necks with respect to the way we run our business. I used to work in the medical device world, and it was one thing to have the ISO auditor come in because we paid the ISO auditor to come in for a certain number of days per year and evaluate our systems. But when the FDA came in to look at our development and manufacture and service of medical devices, 
they had deep pockets. They could sit there and audit as long as they wanted. So that's one reason why often companies don't want to see regulations guiding their um, guiding their information security. They'd really rather do it in a voluntary manner. So there are different approaches to managing cybersecurity. And the first two are things that are already in place. Your customers are asking for information security through their contracts. And then you've got a number of business decisions that say, this is the way we're going to operate. We're going to lock our doors. We're going to have passwords. We're going to have um, certain screening on our employees with access to information and so forth. You've got a number of business decisions. And sometimes, depending on the industry you're in and the countries you operate in and whether you're publicly or privately traded, you have other regulatory controls. And if these apply to you, you've probably become familiar with them and maybe not. Like the um, Health Information Privacy Act, U.S. requirements, or Sarbanes-Oxley about financial information in for publicly traded companies, or GDPR, the General Directive on Privacy Regulation in Europe. I may have gotten those words wrong. We just know it as GDPR, but it's about protecting private information so that your email address and phone number and so forth aren't um, aren't divulged unnecessarily to people who don't have a need to know. But what companies are doing instead of waiting for regulations to tell them what to do is adopting voluntary standards like ISO 27001 we're talking about today. I'm curious if you'd write it in the comments section. Let me know, is your company pursuing the NIST framework or ISO 27001 or any other regulatory requirements that may apply to you? I appreciate hearing what's uh, you know who's on the call so I can tailor things to tailor some comments to you directly. Well, here's the front cover of ISO 27001, Information Technology, Security Techniques, Information Security Management System Requirements. This is the only document in the ISO 27001 series that has the word requirements in it. So if you're in the telecom world, for example, you may be asked to show um, compliance with ISO 27017. That's one of the guidance documents that supports ISO 27001. And uh, you can't actually get certified to it because there are no shalls in the guidance documents. There are only the only requirements for certification are in 27001. You could get a letter of attestation from DeSera or from a certification body that says, yes, we've been evaluated against these best practices in the guidance documents and we do comply, but you can't get an accredited certification to ISO 27000 X other than 27001. But what's in this standard is designed to help your company preserve confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information. And the big difference in this standard versus others that you may have is that it's a management system that requires a particular approach to risk management so that interested parties, such as customers and shareholders and regulators and, and um, uh, potential customers and employees can have uh, confidence that their, that their private information remains private and that when they need information, it'll have integrity and it'll be available. So speaking particularly about ISO 27001, what are you required to have to get certified to 27001? We're moving into the meat of the presentation and what companies actually do to achieve certification. Well, the first step is to establish the management system, which starts at the top with leadership saying, this is how much of the organization is going to be included. So if you're a major conglomerate, you may say, just the part that's dealing with government contracts uh, on this product line will be certified. But you can't just, I, I don't, I don't want to say you can't because technically you can, but you don't want to have a scope that's so narrow that it's, um, that it's, likely to leak anyway, such as we're only putting our IT department into the scope. And our objective is to keep our IT department safe. Uh, that, wouldn't be, um, that wouldn't be appropriate because as I told you, ISO 27001 affects the whole organization. So it's got to start at the top establishing the, the, that we're going to have a system and what are our objectives. And then you implement the requirements for processes and controls and resources, competence, equipment, machinery, all those kinds of things to show that you are able to protect information. And then you evaluate. You maintain the system operating according to the um, according to what you set up in the establishment and implementation. 
and you monitor for are we continuing to do this systematically and consistently. And the fourth step in assuring information security management under ISO 27001 is to continually improve through the results of reviewing your data and the results of reviewing your internal and external audits saying what do we need to do to improve. This structure of ISO 27001 will be familiar to those of you who have done any quality management systems, environmental management systems, other types of ISO management systems. It all starts over here on the left with understanding the context of the organization, the internal and external issues that affect you that make it important for you to manage the security of information. So you could say uh, we've got internal issues where we've got high levels of proprietary information that anybody could take and use um, and use externally to accomplish uh, uh, to accomplish nefarious deeds. You know, you start to you start to look at what are the things that we have and what are the external pressures that make us need to control access and, and availability of our information. It all starts then with leadership defining the scope and the and the objectives, and then the organization planning for success, operating according to what they've planned evaluating performance with the metrics and the internal audits of the system and then making improvements year after year after year to get better and better at information security management system. Support underlying this would be things like um, having an internal audit system or having a document management system or having a help desk to take calls and so forth. So there are a number of support functions that would enable all of this having various processes in place. Now hanging over here on the outside of the typical management system is in the appendix of ISO 27001. It's an appendix, but it's very much included in ISO 27001 because in clause eight, it says that you, or clause six, I forget which one, it says you have to take into account the controls listed in Annex A. Well, what's a control? It's a method that you use to, keep, to make sure that you keep control of your information, uh, to protect against bad things happening to your information. So for example, something that says, we're gonna make sure that the external uh, property of our, uh, you know, that people can't get in the doors of our building. That would be a control, a very simple control. We're gonna lock the doors. Another control might be, we're gonna have passwords that can't be shared. And we'll go through what those controls are in the middle of this presentation. As we move forward, I'll show you what those 114 controls that you have to include in operation are, much more prescriptive than anything you'd see in ISO 9001. ISO 27001 is also designed to take into account various regulatory or customer specific models that you may have to respond to and assure your customers that yes, we're also doing these other things. You knit those into, integrate them into your management system. Here's a sampling of the requirements that are included in the body of ISO 27001. And we're not gonna go through all of these today because I think they're pretty, um, I think most of them are pretty self-explanatory if you've worked in a, in a business with a management system. Uh, but these are the things that we go through in an implementation workshop with your organization so you understand what has to actually happen. And then in some of our models, we actually begin implementing a few of these pieces. But the two lines that are underlined, information security risk assessment and information security risk treatment are different in ISO 27001 and not found anyplace else. So uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about those as we go through uh, clause eight of, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, controls in version eight and also what's what it takes to implement the management system. But the idea is you've got to be sure what we have, what are we trying to protect, and demonstrate that you're doing something to protect those information assets of the business. What you do are contained in these controls. And I'll just throw the names of these things up there. I consider them the bricks in the wall that you, uh, that you build up to protect the information that you know it needs to be kept available and in working order so that all the information is there and not corrupt accessible to people that they uh, that they can get inside without undue uh, need for uh, for getting permissions again and again and again for things that they use on a daily basis. Um, 
and these are these need to be knitted into your management system in the way we do things around here. Anytime I say management system, just think to yourself the rules and practices that we govern ourselves by so that we make sure we protect our information. So now we'll go through each of these 14, they call them domains. Uh, they are defined in the in the appendix of ISO um, 27001. And if you want to follow along in your book and just make a couple of lines about each of these, you'll see them on page three of your workbook so that you can follow along and take a few notes on what each requirement, uh, what each one of these controls is about. Why do we start with domain number five? Domain number five, information security policies. Well, the reason is that Appendix A starts numbering, Appendix A where these are found in 27001, starts with the number five. And they did that to comply with other management systems that are numbered in a similar way. So domain five through 18 are the numbers, not one through 14, but there are 14 of these that we're gonna go through here. If we're going through these and you have any questions, please use the, you're muted, so please use the question panel on the GoToMeeting question, on the GoToMeeting uh, control panel and ask your questions and I'll answer them either in line with the presentation or at the end, depending on uh, uh, the relevance. So first of all, domain five talks about information security policies. Remember I told you the ISMS starts at the top. So this control actually says management must establish a set of policies to direct and support information security. That is, they need to take into account the relevant laws and regulations and the needs of the business, including what the customer wants. It starts at the top that says the way you control security of your information is that management needs to mandate it through the creation of a number of policies that say what we're going to do around here. Now, there will be normally a general overall guiding policy that says something along the lines of, we aim to protect confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information used within and outside of our company for the benefit of our customers um, and continually improve our management of that information through complying with all um, relevant regulatory and uh, uh, contractual obligations. Something along those lines, a big, broad, overreaching. It is our policy to protect information. And then you'll have a number of subordinate policies that also support specific areas of um, security. And those should be directed by management, signed off by management. Domain six talks about setting up the organization roles and responsibilities so that you can be sure somebody, the buck stops, stops someplace. And certain people have certain authorities and responsibilities that other people don't. For example, somebody's got to protect the information from everybody else. Everybody can't have the same keys to all the information. So you have systems administrators and network administrators, for example, who have extra privileged roles or certain managers have extra privileged roles that they can make approvals. So who has those roles? ISO 27001 in domain six says set up those roles and responsibilities and make sure you also cover people in different roles like working remotely or working using mobile devices. Remember I said that ISO 27001 is not just an IT exercise. It affects everyone in the company. Well, you'll see in domain seven, clause A7 of the appendix of ISO 27001, that human resources security is called out. If you're gonna give somebody the keys to the kingdom and let them be a systems administrator, or if you're gonna let somebody be a manager and decide who gets access to what, or if you're even gonna give your rank and file user access to information, you probably wanna have some level of screening to be sure that they haven't um, been involved in nefarious deeds at other places. You're not gonna hire somebody that has a conviction on their record for hacking into systems. You may not even want somebody who's got a got any kind of other criminal activity on their record. Or you may say if they do, you know, they were in a bar fight when they were 22, you're going to require that to be um, signed off by senior leadership or something. So you'd have screening of employees, making sure everybody attests or signs off on having been trained on the, uh, uh, that they agree to work by the policies and procedures. And then what happens when they leave the company? Those would all be parts of human resources security. Remember I told you about fundamental ISO 27001 is the assessment of risks 
and the treatment of those risks, mitigating against those risks to reduce your exposure to information security breaches. Well, Domain 8, Appendix A8, uh, Appendix A1, uh, Section 8, requires you to identify what information do we have, who owns it, like who has the authority to grant permission to use it or how it will be used. And how do we make sure that if information is used, how do we make sure we get it back uh, or people no longer have access to it after they're not after their their use for it has um, expired? So clause eight, uh, domain eight talks about classifying assets based on risk, highly critical, critical, proprietary, public. Those might be four exam four um, classifications of assets that you would have, and then you handle highly critical, very different than you would handle proprietary or public information. So those uh, those rules are very much knitted into the way you do um, risk assessment and risk treatment, that you know what we have and how critical it is. Before you give people access to information, you want to act on the principle of uh, need to know. You don't want people who need to know information have to go through an inordinate number of steps to get access to information they're using on a daily basis nor do you want to open up information such as all your financial data for the company to the rank and file user. However, I've seen people with inadequately used SharePoint systems that let everybody get into all kinds of things, not generally the financial information, but a lot of stuff that they may not need access to that could expose the company to the risk of loss of integrity, loss of information entirely, maybe not so much on SharePoint, but on shared directories and so forth. So domain nine says, Make sure that people who need to have access to information and only those people have access and you've got an approval system for who gets that information. Cryptography is a very short clause in Appendix A. It establishes policies for the use of encryption. So for example, your laptop may be encrypted. You have to just sign on just to get into the laptop to begin with. So that if anybody stole your laptop, they can't even get to the first thing on it. That would be a policy for the use of encryption. All laptops are going to be encrypted, but also which protocols are used for encryption and uh, many other technical aspects of encryption that the IT people are aware of. You're going to have policies for the use of it, and they're going to be governed by somebody who is defined to be the governor of those keys. Appendix A11 talks about physical and environmental security. This is another one that affects everyone in the company. It may be largely managed by facilities and by IT to make sure the doors stay locked and that secure areas are only accessible by people with a need to get in there to the data center, the control rooms and so forth. Um, but it also, uh, you know, badging in and badging out. How about where your cables are laid? Is there a possibility that somebody could get into a control room managed by the landlord of your building and wreak havoc with your systems? So make sure that your facilities are kept to the appropriate level of security. You know, can somebody who can't get in the front door walk around and get into the loading dock? I, I was working with a company recently that was um, getting ready to pursue 27001. We were doing their initial gap assessment. How do you stand right now? And they had a system where everyone had to badge in. Great, you go, go out to lunch, you have to badge to come back in. So they had protection on how do you get in and into the building. And obviously when you go out, it's triggered, they got cameras and things like that. As we walked around the building, we realized that the side doors, anybody could walk out a side door and let their pizza delivery person come in, for example, let their, uh, let their coworkers boyfriend in. Little did they know that the coworkers boyfriend worked for a competitor's company and may not need to have access to things that were inside this company. So they had leaks all over the building. Not only that, at busy times of day, they just held the turnstile open and let people just walk through. So it wasn't as secure as they might have thought. And doing a gap assessment, we raised the awareness of their physical and environmental security. So that's an example of one that has to be socialized throughout the company. So maybe some things that were common practice when you go for 27001 certification aren't so common anymore. Now remember, we're going domains four, uh, 5 through 18. We're on domain 12 of Annex A of ISO 27001, the controls that you need to put in place to assure the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of your information. 
Domain 12, I don't know why they buried it so deep into the, into the appendix, is really the crux of operating in a secure manner. These are the things that IT does to make sure that your systems are backed up. You've got uh, protection against malware, you know, the antivirus stuff, the McAfee or whatever you have on your computers. Um, that you've set up documented procedures for uh, the things that IT does with the system so that they don't lose availability, lock people out, have an outage, or let hackers get into the system. Um, there's no way that IT could watch all the watch all the systems and be sure everything's happening okay. They have electronic monitoring going on that keeps records and that alerts someone when there's a suspicious activity going on. So that has to have evidence that they're actually doing that. You can't tell the auditor, oh yeah, yeah, we check over everything. We're gonna look at your evidence that you're doing it. Um, we don't want employees just installing whatever they want on their computer because something you download from the internet may actually have bad stuff in it. So the whole point of 12, uh, domain 12 is for IT to keep the systems from being hacked into or being made not available through some uh, denial of service and so forth. Domain 13 is another one that's run by the, the gearheads. The engineers make sure that the networks work securely so that when you transmit information both inside and outside the company, it's done in a secure manner. So you may have a VPN that you get into when you're working from home. You're not just logging in over, over your regular ISP. You've got to go in through a secure area so that you can't be accidentally hacked into when you're working from Starbucks. Domain 14, another one that's handled by IT developers, system administrators, and so forth. This is making sure that when you uh, put in a new system or when you're developing products or maintaining, you know, applying patches to software and so forth, that it's done in a secure way throughout the life cycle of the system. So maybe you've got all kinds of secure coding principles that you use when you develop a system and then somebody goes in and they're they're applying patches and, and doing updates, uh, new version releases, and they're failing to follow all that stuff that was tested on the original product. That would be not keeping in compliance with the requirements of, um, of uh, control number 14. You want to design security into your systems from the start. Now, you can probably all think of examples of where this has gone wrong. Uh, one that's hit the news was like um, baby monitors or um, video games being hacked into where people can actually hack into your home and see what you're actually doing there. I know when, the, what was it, the Xbox Live, I forget which of the systems that actually have that camera and can tell who's, or, or even, um, even uh, Alexa, you know, aren't you glad that they built in a number of security requirements into those? But a lot of us are still a little suspicious. Do we want those in our home at all? So building security in from the start is what domain 14 is about. Domain 15 is actually what drives a lot of your customers to put requirements on your company for information security. Domain 15 is about supplier relationships. So just as you put things in contracts for your customers, or your company does, that say you're not going to share our information with anybody unless we give you permission or um, when when uh, just as you put those things on on your customers uh, you want to put requirements on your suppliers as well because many times you have to share information about your business with for example a contract test house or a um, somebody who's entering your building to provide facilities maintenance or somebody who your your cloud services provider. You want to be sure that you've got agreements with them for protecting the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of your information. Well, one of uh, my company's biggest suppliers is uh, Microsoft. We use Office 365 and SharePoint for our documents. A few days ago, a couple weeks ago, SharePoint had an outage. I reported it and I looked on the system. It was a third party system that just says who's been reporting outages. And there were big companies, the entire West Coast of California, uh, well, the, all of California with PG&E and, and Southern California Edison, were reporting outages with SharePoint. So you see that maybe you can't put a whole lot of requirements on your suppliers, but you can certainly say we're only going to do business with suppliers who are going to guarantee us a certain level of uptime and a certain response time to problems that we have. So you want to build into your supplier relationships the controls that make sure that your suppliers don't mess you up. 
Domain 16 is about information security incident management. That means that when something suspicious happens at your company, somebody's going to investigate it. Let's just say that uh, Susie's boyfriend was allowed into the building on third shift to bring her dinner. She's working on the help that uh, working working on um, internal support at night. Uh, her boyfriend comes in and wanders around the building looking at isn't all this stuff cool, man? I wish my company had this. And what if he happens to be a spy for someone from outside and nobody's watching him? Luckily, we have well-trained employees inside who know that if I see somebody without a badge on, I'm going to report it to the help desk. And furthermore, I'm going to question the person and ask and escort them out of the building if necessary. Well, then the help desk ought to investigate or help desk or whoever you have assigned to take information security incidents information and you report it directly to the incident management system rather than to Susie and say, Susie, what's your boyfriend doing here? She says, oh, it's okay. And you leave it at that. No, don't do that. Report it in, let it be investigated so that the entire business can get better with what are our security requirements and how do we avoid breaching them. Everybody has to be trained on information security incident management to the level that they need to be involved. So all employees need to know what and how to report and the people involved in investigation need to know how far do you take an investigation? How do you respond to an incident? Domain 17 expects that you have business continuity management within your organization. And not all organizations have a formal system, but one thing you have to build in if you're getting 27,001 certification is appropriate controls to make sure that just because there is an outage doesn't mean that you suddenly fling open the doors and let anybody in who otherwise wouldn't be able to get in. So for example, if you have a fire drill, does everybody exit the building and leave everything open on their desks and um, uh, their screens still open so that a few people that stay behind might be able to gather information they're not supposed to have access to? Or when you have a, uh, what we call a disaster in Dallas where I live, an inch of ice. You know, if we get a dusting of ice, suddenly everybody has to stay home from work because down here, we're just not used to the weather getting that bad. And what happens on those days when everybody's gonna work from home? Are they logging in through a VPN or are they logging in in insecure ways? They're sending information through, for example, Google, uh, Gmail, or, or their, um, their regular personal accounts. Can't be doing that. You've gotta maintain security even during a crisis or disaster and make sure that something fails over to another location, for example. The IT people probably have a lot of controls on this already, but there are a lot of other controls that you probably need to be sure are beefed up to maintain confidentiality, integrity, and availability in a business continuity situation. Now, here we are on the last domain of Annex A of uh, ISO 27001, and this is the one that says it's not enough to just say you're doing all this stuff. It's not enough just to say that you have uh, reviewed your interested parties and their requirements. We've got a control here that spells out you've got to have independent review. Somebody outside your company reviewing your company for compliance with the standard. You've got to have management review. You've got to have technical compliance review like vulnerability testing on your products. And then you've also got to have the legal and contractual requirements understood and applied. For example, what applies your intellectual property, protection of records, PII, encryption compliance. Those would all be things that would be included in compliance in domain 18, often um, covered by um, uh, product managers and, and the legal staff and the people at, at uh, not the rank and file, but these would be handled through the information security management system is one aspect of making sure that you've applied 27,001 correctly. So those are the things that companies have to do to get certified to ISO 27001. You have to, you have to address all 14 of those domains, all 114, as they apply to you or justify that they don't apply to you. And you have to have the management system that includes management review and internal audits and, and control of documents and competence and objectives and all those things that a management system has that I began with. But when it comes time to say, okay, we're gonna pursue certification. When DeSera works with our clients on certification, we break it down into um, three distinct sections, planning, implementation, and certification, which we'll go through. And again, 
follow along in your workbook and ask any questions about these in the questions section and I'll get to those questions afterwards. Phase one is the planning phase and it all starts at the top with an executive sponsor who says, yep, we got budget for this this year and all my colleagues at the executive level are going to pony up members of their teams to make sure that all the, all the departments that are within scope are complying and are working toward ISO 27001 certification. At that point, what DeSera does when working with our clients is we come in and we do a five to eight day, five or eight day launch workshop. In that launch workshop, we train the core team on what they need to know in order to implement ISO 27001 and establishing how far is this, uh, is this system going to reach, which departments, which locations, which functions are going to be included and plan the project. In the eight-day workshop, we actually begin doing some of the implementation steps that I'll that I'll um, show you on the next slide. But this is the point where management says, "Yes, we're going to do the project. Here's who's going to work on it, and here's when we expect it to be completed, and that you have the go forward, do this." You cannot get ISO 27001 without. It's not something that IT can do as a grassroots effort and expect to get certification. It's got to be at the management level. Now, phase two implementation is where you go out and decide which one of those controls, well, we know which ones apply to us. Now, exactly how are we going to implement those controls? And you document what you're doing to implement all those controls. And you go through, remember I said in domain eight, and also clauses six and eight of the standard, it requires you to identify your assets, assess the risks against your information assets, and mitigate those risks to the extent that your organization has a stomach for risk. So you're not going to, you may not do anything about the low risk items, but you definitely attack the high risk items that management says we can't live with that. During the implementation phase, you've got to get everyone on board, understanding what their requirements are. And if any of those, uh, if any information breaches happen, who actually reports and investigates those? Get a working incident management system and a working corrective action system going. After you've implemented, then you're ready to move into certification. The overlap there is internal audits. It's still technically part of implementation and it's an ongoing activity, but we recommend, Sarah recommends that you do your internal audits when you're about three quarters of the way done, about 80%. When you've done the stuff that gets you the big bang for the buck, do your first round of internal audits. Then you get your marching orders for what else do we have to finish up so that we're ready for certification do a second round of internal audits that make sure everything's buttoned up, implemented, and you have data to support it. Because when the certification body comes in, and we'll talk about what's involved in certification in a minute, they're going to do two phases of audits. So we recommend that you finish implementation at the 12 to 15 month mark. And then in that 12 to 18 month mark, you've got time to get your certification. So if you said one of our goals for 2018 is to get certified to ISO 27001, you're probably already behind at this point in December. If you're listening to this later, you're way behind, but uh, give yourself at least a year to get it implemented and then three to six months to get certification. Certification happens in two, actually, actually a third phase. The first one is your certification body, who's an outside company, not a consulting company, they're an impartial outside company who is accredited to audit companies against ISO 27001 and say, yay, barely, they meet the requirements, they are, I can, I can support stamp, putting our company's name behind saying they meet these requirements. The first thing they do is they come in when you say, okay, we've got everything in place, we may not have implemented everything, but by the time you come back for stage two, we will have. They come in and they sit down with just a couple of leaders of the, um, of the management system and say, have you documented all this stuff right? If you do everything that you've written down and you continue to follow your implementation plan, will you be ready to have an actual certification audit where we check that you've done everything you said you were gonna do? You know, the old rallying cry, say what you do, do what you say. The say what you do is in the readiness assessment, but do what you say, measure it and improve it is in the stage two audit. They make sure that it's not just on paper, that you've actually been doing what your plan says. When the certification body comes in, it's not an inspection. 
they're not looking at the deep dive into have you done every word of every control. Rather, they're doing a confirmation of the system. You should be doing the inspections internally. You should have people looking and checking over each other's work, peer reviews and so forth. Are we doing these things right? An external auditor will take a sample of the system to confirm what they've found is either you do comply or you don't comply. It's not subjective. The auditor can't go in and say, well, I've seen a lot of companies doing it this way and I think you ought to be doing it that way too. No, all they can do is say there is a requirement in ISO 27001 and there is evidence that you're actually doing this or evidence or lack of evidence to show that you're doing it so they can write an objective statement of conformance or non-conformance against the standard and any other requirements that you put in. As I said, it's not just about the, the bits and bytes, the hardware and software. They're looking for an organizational approach. And it's not something where they just, uh, you just tell them information and they write it all down, you know, to, that they just answer their questions. It should be a two-way dialogue. In fact, when you go into an audit, if you've never been through one, what will typically happen is the auditor will ask a very open-ended question like, tell me how you do, tell me how you've identified and assessed the risks against um, the, the, this particular area of the business. And you'll tell them and then they'll ask some follow-on questions. They're not going to say, show me your procedure for this and then check each word of the procedure that's actually been implemented. They'll be asking questions, open-ended questions, uh, and asking for clarifications along the way. Whoops. Okay, when you get initially certified, you get a certificate for three years. Okay, they say, we expect that if you keep doing what you're doing, we've just had your certification audit, if you keep doing what you're doing, you will be certified for three years. However, they know that things drift. So the certification system is set up so that every year, after year one and year two, they'll come in and they'll do what they call a surveillance audit. And if something has drifted or they see something that they didn't see on the past audit that maybe they just didn't check, they'll come back in and say, oh, you have a non-conformance here, a non-conformance there. I see a risk here. You're complying, but maybe you maybe there's a high risk of not complying. And then on the third year, you have a recertification audit and your certificate will get a new date on it and say it's good for another three years. What the DeSera group does in all this, we're not the certification body. We don't go in and slap a certificate on you and say, by our company's good name, we say to your customers and other interested parties that yay barely, you meet these requirements. Instead, what we do is we guide and accelerate your ISMS development. Sometimes a company can take that initial launch workshop and say, great, we've got the internal guidance that we can do, that we can work through this on our own. We don't need external hands on deck. To, uh, to get our certification by the time that we want to get it. But other companies say, whoa, you just put an extra X number of hours a month onto our business and we're not going to hire for that only to let those people go in an hour. We'll bring Sarah in on a contract basis to um, do some of the work for us, uh, guide our people so they don't go down the wrong path and have to come back and do it again, um, just to make sure that we reach our certification by the date that we expect to. We have senior people, people with 20, 25 or more years of experience in the industry. We don't bring in the young IT professionals to do the bits and bytes for you. We come in to guide the development of the management system. Um, we intend to reduce the time and expense and ensure your first time certification with minimal non-conformances. One of our clients, we, I mean, when we do internal audits for a client, we're looking in every nook and cranny. We came out with them last year with, I don't know, 50 different non-conformances across six different sites, um, everything from minor non-conformances. They didn't really have any majors in there. They didn't have any majors left in their uh, final audit before certification. They fixed up everything that they could or had corrective action plans in place for everything that was a minor non-conformance. Their auditor came in and wrote them exactly one non-conformance on their um, certification and the only reason they got that non-conformance was they they already knew they weren't in compliance but they hadn't been making sufficient progress toward it so our goal is to help you get certified with minimal non-conformances when you're done you know you're on the right track you don't have a bunch of things to fix up so what should you do for your next steps on certifying to ISO 27001 implementing a management system 
Well, you really need to study ISO 27001. We have these free webinars and articles. We'll have another webinar coming up next quarter about um, what CBs expect when they come in to audit you. Those are free. But we also offer courses, and you'll see next quarter the virtual classroom for um, understanding and implementing ISO 27001. You can take that just like you're taking this webinar, except it'll be a smaller group. We'll interact back and forth just like in a classroom with cameras on and talk to each other like a classroom. You can begin doing a self-assessment self and set objectives for what you want to achieve with certification. Why would you even pursue certification? Get your management on board and start the planning. And then, uh, and when you're ready, you begin working with a certification body and if needed, to Sarah to come in and do your, your training and your internal audits and some of your implementation efforts with you. We can provide that briefing up front to get management on board. We do those launch workshops. We consult with you throughout implementation and we can do your internal audits, pre-certification and ongoing. So we're here to help you get through it. And with that, we're almost at the top of the hour. So I'd like to ask if there are any questions. I don't see any that have come in just yet. Uh, Mariah, if um, my assistant Mariah is uh, listening in and is capturing any questions that may have come in via email. So I'll give you a minute to ask any more questions and I'll stay on the line if, if uh, past the top of the hour if needed. But if, uh, if there are no questions, I wanna thank you for joining us and you will be receiving a, um, the, the entire presentation. You can download the PDF right now from the handout section of the control panel. You'll get an email tomorrow with a link to watch it. Maybe you wanna show it at a lunch and learn for your group or maybe you want to just go through the slides and explain, which you can download right now and explain to your colleagues what you learned from this webinar. So I look forward to seeing you on future webinars and possibly at your site for an implementation workshop. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.